Chris. Okay. So hello and welcome to all who are joining us today. My name's Lisa. I'm an organizational development and change candidate here at Fielding for the PhD. And let's see. Overall, appreciating all who joined us today to talk about collaborative engagement and success with integrating qualitative and quantitative data for DEI or uh, JEDI, social justice here at our conference, the alumni, appreciating all who uh, had efforts in, in putting together our sessions this week. And so to get started with a little bit about who's in our room today, we may have a chance for breakout rooms and interaction overall for engagement throughout our session. If you'd like to have the QR code scanned in the middle of our screen next to the fielding logo, we have a fun map that gets to identify kind of pinpoint where all of you are joining us from today. It's just a general uh, by state or just by region. We know that our feeling community is national, international. And so we'll be glad to, if you'd like to scan the QR code or just in case, I do have here the link to put in the chat, which I'll drop in just a moment, just in case, in addition to the QR code. So I'll just pause for a moment and drop that in the chat here. And uh, that should, uh, let's see. Then I will um, share the screen with the results here in just a moment. So let's see. Oh, I'm gonna zoom out where we're joining from. So we can see our regions here. So let me drop this in the chat. And I know many of you are joining from the East Coast as well. So there's our link to our map. And I'm, I'm in uh, California. So I'm also one of the colleagues of our cluster, Bay Area, San Francisco. So appreciate that we have alumni uh, that are engaged with us today and current students. So I'm trying to zoom out a little bit further. So a few key points here. Looks like we have Austin, Texas. And maybe Southern California. So that's great. So please feel free to continue to fill in your points there. Let's see, we have Northern California too. Always fun to see where we have our colleagues logging in from. So thanks for that. So and there will be more opportunities to engage throughout and be interactive. So overall, let's see, I'm just going to reshare the presentation today and get started with a couple of key questions about our fielding community and a question that aligns with our conference theme and goals. How do we foster co-creating equitable futures with justice, equity, diversity, inclusion in the 21st century and beyond, whether that's in organizational context or school context, whether you work K through 12 or with adult learners in higher ed and what that looks like in terms of classrooms and communities, safe and brave spaces, providing opportunities for individuals, just faculty, staff, students and alumni to engage uh, in both their thoughts and their insights and also towards actionable goals and also as lifelong learners here and in learning communities overall as we call ourselves scholar practitioners uh, here at Fielding and that uh, applied approach so that uh, definitely connects to our, our theme overall for the 21st century and beyond and just thinking about um, just a little bit about background of how I arrived at this uh, topic and overall for the dissertation as focused on um, first-generation students. I'm a first-generation graduate doctoral student. I'm also a member of the Fielding Inclusion Council and have a little over 12 years in the field of education with the privilege of supporting, um, starting out in admissions and student services in higher ed and you know, working in education technology, helping to implement curriculum into the classroom and technologies for K through 12 and in higher ed. And also I'm um, serving as board of director and commissioner and in the past chair for Inclusive Excellence Councils working with our clusters at Fielding. And my background is in sociology with a concentration in organizations and inequalities. And my minor is focused in IT and science and technology, how technology shapes learning and our experiences and vice versa, how learning experiences shape technology and our resources, especially with access to technology, the digital divide, bridging um, accessibility and affordability, particularly of internet access. And also um, with uh, educational leadership and human development. Uh, focus for uh, masters previously at Fielding and at Santa Clara University. So, just wanting to go to our next step here to talk about. Let's see. 
how these questions connect to our key goals for today. And we'll have a chance to chat about it and maybe a quick breakout room with a paired, paired session. So in, engaging our key goals today, learning about how we can equip our learning communities, our faculty, staff, students, and alumni with strategies for best practices and research, uh, resources and how we can approach retaining enrollment towards completion. And I'll talk about the context of that now with uh, the advent of uh, learning and working from home, how we can continue to build bridges to create support systems for students, faculty, staff, and alumni, and how we can provide resources and identify the needs for diverse communities, uh, including in and outside of the classroom, technology and access to support, funding, and different ways and perspectives to think about it, including some demographic perspectives where students can be either new or non-traditional as uh, caregivers. Uh, we know that we have many adult learners at uh, building, maybe approaching their second careers. Um, also ability accommodations as well as demographic phenomena such as the sandwich generation. So individuals who may be taking care of their own children at the same time as uh, their parents or other responsibilities while being a student or also professional. And so uh, how do we approach this with a learner-centered focus academically especially for under-resourced and underrepresented students. And many um, surveys have shown and reports of data that what serves and focuses on under-resourced and underrepresented students also benefits all students as well. And um, particularly also with first-generation student support programs as a focus for my dissertation study. And then how do we utilize the, these demographic data points, qualitative, quantitative, narrative data. So whether we're gathering a survey of fielding our student experiences, or we're looking at a maybe publicly available data report or profile of the school, how do we gather from that anticipating the needs of students, faculty and staff and alumni as well in um, communities as lifelong learners and scholar practitioners? And then how do we engage that or create a framework for systems thinking for um, providing resources for the future towards students striving towards their goals and their full potential and as a whole for our community? So, Thinking about the context for this as an introduction, so we, we've heard about and be on the news that there's a lot impacting our economy today, our society, and the future of work and learning, hybrid access uh, to technology, education. And so actually, we've seen some of the most significant declines in enrollment these past two decades in California and um, in history nationally overall. So Right now, about 1 million fewer students are enrolled um, or have enrolled in college. Uh, we're now approaching that deadline where students are deciding where to go for institutions next year. Uh, we have heard that um, it is a good market that students are graduating into in terms of um, postgraduate opportunities. But we have seen that in terms of the FAFSA or applying for federal student aid, there's been about a 10% decrease both in California and overall nationally in students applying for aid overall to attend school. So how do we then take these data points uh, together and kind of figure out the way to best support students with this decline in enrollment, potentially the decline in students maybe applying for aid or maybe thinking that um, post-secondary education might be a possibility for them. Uh, now important now more than ever. So as we go back to some of our key points, um, I'd like to pause here and ask a few questions. Let's see, I'm gonna go back. Or to our next step here to a couple of key things. So we talked about new and non-traditional students. So students that may be outside of the particular age ranges that maybe sometimes undergraduate institutions serve. So students might be working full-time at the same time they're earning undergraduate degrees. We talked about the sandwich generation and then maybe exploring factors and how we can create an adaptive resource or a metric that you can apply to whether it's your institution, community college level, what key factors matter the most for the communities and, and learning um, communities and stakeholders where you are. So that's how I arrived at one of the key questions about what kind of demographic points should we look at that are the most effective measures of diversity, equity, and inclusion, sort of like an equity quotient among either K through 12 or post-secondary. And so similar to how you may have heard in the SAT, they have an adversity score. So they look at the student's demographics who's taking the SAT or standardized tests as a framework now, which now is test optional for many institutions. But what if we had a holistic framework to measure or evaluate the profile of schools, of institutions, and how we can collectively um, look at our lens of diversity, accessibility, and uh, with combining quantitative and qualitative factors that are equally important. So, 
with that in mind, oops, I'd like to ask a couple questions in our interactive survey here. So we have another QR code and I'll drop this in the chat link as well. So who and maybe what are key demographic factors in your community? So whether you work in a school or in an organization with students, adult learners, or maybe even um, previously in your career before you came to feeling or coaching, what are the key factors that impact the individuals that you work with or serve as a scholar practitioner, as a lifelong learner and a leader? And I will go ahead and also pause here a moment to provide the link for this in the chat. And this will generate a word bubble of our responses. So the link's now in the chat. To respond, you're welcome to use the QR code here as well. And then in just a moment, we may have a couple answers populated here. And we also have a chance for a short breakout room after this too, maybe pair off. Thinking about our first question key demographic factors where you are, whether regionally, it could be gender-based, the ages of students or age ranges, employment status, anything that you know impacts your community significantly. So I will, let's see, let's present you. So we'll see if uh, I populate pretty much. We have people of color, women, young, so yeah, feel free to continue. And even if you would like to just unmute or even add on the chat, any factors or any context to it, anything you'd like to add, student voice, education age. So yeah, just wanted to give a brief um, kind of introduction to the context, some of the key points and questions. And um, this can be definitely more of a conversation with a small group here. So would anyone like to unmute or add in the chat any context to why they selected the factors or what they're seeing here in our word cloud? Yeah, any of these points here that speak to you that you'd like to you talk about why you selected them or entered it in? And that's okay too. I know it's towards the end of the day, or if you prefer in our small groups in just a bit, we can. I'll uh, pitch in. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Thank you. All right. I dropped in late to this thing, so I, hopefully I'm not being more disruptive than helpful. You're more than welcome. But, um, anyway, I, I um, grew up on the East Coast. Uh, and with a very liberal orientation um, and now live in Tucson, Arizona in an environment which is uh, very conservative or often so. Um, and so I, 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 for the first time in my life, was suddenly very <clears throat> conscious of the politics of the people around me and um, found myself biting my tongue um, more than I have ever imagined I would. Um, I lived just down the street from where our state representative was almost murdered uh, a few years ago. And there's just this kind of feeling around here that politics is fraught. And so that's why I put down political orientation. It, it seems to be very much in the air. And uh, certainly the events of recent days hasn't helped. Yeah, well, definitely appreciate you sharing and, uh, and your thoughts there. Yes, as, as we see kind of a, a climate of, especially with online forums, um, providing opportunities and platforms, we also see sometimes maybe, uh, you know, a divisiveness of opinion or different platforms where opinion can be uh, either magnified or in other you know, contexts. So yeah, thank you for that and for sharing. Um, and also, you're welcome to, we, we did a little exercise where we, we added in where we're from. So more than welcome to if, if you didn't get a chance to add in the chat where you're from alumni um you know and uh, where you're joining from today will do and yes yeah, so thank you would anyone else like to speak to the points they added or that are here about the context of what factors impact the community and why in my community i feel like the demographic that i work with um is pretty representative of the population in texas um, I said young people of color, women, um, but it's not represented by the um, elected officials 
in our state. So that tension between um, between the populations that I uh, teach and work with and uh, whether or not their interests are being represented by our elected officials is, is very ongoing. And because I teach at a state funded school, um, it permeates through the structure of the school and the, the policies of the school as well. Yeah, that's a great point. Thank you for bringing up uh, the multi-level kind of stakeholders of organizations and do the leaders at different levels reflect the communities and populations they serve, especially with um, one term that I've heard recently, what you talked about reminded me of um, snow capped organizations. So uh, in a sense, you know, at the at the bottom, maybe you have a sense of diversity, you know, front facing or overall, whether it's, you know, learning communities or otherwise, but at the top, still very much maybe homogenous or saying we're not entirely reflective of communities. So yeah, thank you for that. And, and those are, uh, uh, instances where we think about, you know, who's setting the policies and the practices and the frameworks that impact the communities the most, and are they connected to those those changes? Uh, who will be impacted the most? And um, those policies, how can we shape or frame them in a way that's most beneficial uh, to the key communities? So, yeah, any other thoughts here before we move on to our next question? Great, so yeah, so similar note here, let's see. Okay. Are shared for the next question. And if anyone is also right. Oh, you're muted, please. Thank you. Yeah, I was muted. So if uh, anyone is also arrived a little later, please feel free to um, in the chat or even if you were here, Eric, put your uh, connection to fielding or where you're joining in from today if you'd like. Um, so now moving on to our second key question. Going back to what are some factors that you would consider in a climate survey? So for example, one approach in particular that some administrators, particularly at higher ed level and other levels and, and schools have been asking about what are the factors that impact the climate or sense of belonging for the key stakeholders that are there in their communities. So whether it's their students, the families or parents of students, the faculty, the staff, what are some questions that you would want to ask you know, people in your community or what were some factors or maybe key areas that you'd like to know more about to determine or identify their needs. So it could be anything from, you know, work-life balance or life-work balance, as I've heard of, but, you know, in terms of especially with um, you know, hybrid or learning or working from home, it could be, you know, our, our financial, you know, models for, you know, financial aid supportive to students. Is there anything else we can do differently to help it be more accessible? So feel free to, it's the same link uh, as before. And you're more than welcome to also scan the QR code if you prefer. And it will also bring you to the second question of what questions would you like to ask your community about how to better understand their needs or what we might call a climate survey to understand how the context is impacting them. So any factors, feel free to take a moment to think about that. Or do you have a climate survey already in your institution or community or organization? And what are the questions look like or questions you wished were asked? So we have a few minutes to think about that. And I'll, I'll give a choice. Would you like to break off into pairs of breakout rooms and come back to talk about these? Or would you just like to continue as a large group overall for our session? So um, you're welcome to either unmute or put in the chat. Um, if you want a breakout room, you can put breakout room in the chat, or if you want to just stay as a group, you can put group in the chat. So I'm definitely open to the session being shaped by your, your preferences. So if you want a breakout room, you can indicate it in the chat, or if you prefer to stay as a whole group since we're a small group. Okay, yep, large group, no problem. Yep, okay, no problem. Sounds good. So we'll, we can always stay here and as more answers come in, think about. I see some great ones here already. Value ROI, and I think that's a great one because there's recently a survey from Georgetown that talked about the institutions that have the highest return on investment in particular for um, institutions that are um, different colleges across the country. So Georgetown looked at, you know, which colleges serve the students with the most need financially and compared it to you know students postgraduate um, you know success whether that was you know a job six months after graduation maybe pursuing post secondary study or graduate study um, so they had at the top 
institutions that had the largest return on investment for the communities in most need or the students uh, that were most underserved. So that's a, a Georgetown University uh, workforce. I have the link to that if anyone's interested, in that, maybe after our session today. But um, I've also heard of the phrase return on impact. So how are we positively impacting, not only um, monetary wise or funding wise, but possibly impacting students in their formation as a whole person, holistically, as a scholar practitioner. Stakeholder evaluation is a great one too. So definitely have different levels of, are we engaging with individuals who are the decision makers? Are they talking to the, the communities that are impacted the most? So for example, do we have students talking to administrators? Constraints, aspirations, collaboration, these are all great points. There was a, an example from an administrator or a session that I attended recently that talked about, they looked at the recipients of their scholarship, um, the individuals or students who received their scholarships the most and the funding opportunities and the fellowships. And they realized that the student populations that are receiving the most scholarships weren't exactly reflective or the most diverse of, of their entire student body population. So then they decided, you know, how do we create an outreach plan to ensure the students who need it the most that are reflective of our population are applying and receiving these funding and scholarship opportunities. So they were looking at creating an outreach plan, whether it's email based, social media based, even reaching out to faculty to have students recommended. Um, so thinking about kind of those types of examples. There was another example where there are certain requirements for students at an undergraduate level to finish or to graduate, but that's sometimes dependent on the number of classes that are offered and when during the year. And so some administrators were not aware that the departments were not offering all the required classes during the during each quarter of the year. So then we need student groups. And in the past institutions I've been at had student groups that had to highlight and bring up, this is a class that was required for graduation, but it's only offered once a year during a time frame where students might be working off campus, students might be commuting. And for some of those students that meant, you know, if they couldn't take that class at one particular quarter, they would need to stay a fifth year. And for some of those students, they had a four year scholarship. So staying a fifth year, quote unquote, for that extra class would uh, impact or jeopardize their funding. And in turn, that fifth year then impacts the institution's overall four or six year graduation rate. And uh, the federal government uses that four to six year graduation rate to then determine what institutions are eligible for federal funding or for the FAFSA. So as you can see, there are different levels there that are impacted as far as stakeholders. So students, you know, going into a fifth year, jeopardizing their funding, the institution's rate of four to six year graduation, that then impacting their eligibility with the federal government to then receive more funding for students. So, um, so all of those as factors there, as I see a lot of uh, great new points coming in. So just a couple of key examples. Um, so graduation rate, yes, definitely. So retention and graduation rates are uh, definitely helpful. And there have been a lot of studies that have shown financial constraints have been the number one impact on graduation and retention rates for many students. So mental health, yes, is a big conversation. Uh, recently, there's been an administrative update. So uh, from the federal government to talk about the emergency funds that have been funneled into many K through 12 and higher ed schools are now, um, the time frame for it has been extended to use the federal funds and also to mental health or mental wellness resources for students. So they're now encouraging the hiring of professionals to support students um, across contexts uh, for their, their wellness on campus. So yeah, so thanks for your thoughts on that. And would anyone like to speak to any of the points they added here and why? Um, Lisa, I, I just noticed maybe a little less so at the end of your um, your conversation, but uh, a, a, an emphasis on money and finances. And I wonder, it, it, does that still seem like the highest and best or most useful measurement or unit of exchange? Or, you know, it seems to always come down to money, but does, is it helpful to keep that? Yeah, and, that, and I appreciate your point. And so that's why I, I like the idea of the term of return on impact also kind of mm -hmm. signifying holistically why um, and how students can be impacted, not only in their you know pursuits professionally after graduation, but also in their kind of personal development as well in particular. So thinking about um, how each of those um, 
kind of factors may impact students, whether it's, for example, scholar practitioners at fielding. Uh, one of my uh, most impactful or kind of uh, helpful um, KAs relating to human development talked about identifying who is the most significant leader in your life at different age ranges. So we had the opportunity to talk about looking at the stakeholders in our community and who influence our learning path as, as lifelong learners. Um, so giving students the opportunity to reflect on those um, aspects individually, but also as a whole. So I think that's where the mental health and mental wellness aspect comes in. So a lot of the support programs for first generation students, just providing those safe spaces where students feel comfortable reaching out for resources. There's been a lot of concern on um, uh, housing and food insecurity for many students. So as they approach graduation, you know, even during um, term or summer breaks, many of the students um, may have not had, you know, places to stay or, you know, access to food on campus if, you know, the during the break, you know, the facilities are closed. So thinking about all those resources too that impact academics and not only, as you mentioned, the financial aspects of their tuition, but kind of holistically what, what that experience looks like for many students. So yeah, thanks for your point on that. Well, even when we say return on investment or impact, you know, how are we measuring that return is, is an open question for me. I, I mean, I love the idea of measuring it in terms of empowerment. I, I don't know how you measure that or what the unit of measurement is, but it, if I, you know, you know, easy for me to say as a white guy, but uh, the idea that students would leave uh, empowered somehow strikes me as a, as a very useful return on investment. And I just don't know, I've never seen any way of, of measuring that beyond what's, what's your salary, you know? I agree. And that's one of the key reasons why um, the kind of, I would say, equity quotient or one of the top um, questions. Oh, excuse me, just one moment here. I want to just fix my... So yeah, so that's why one of the key questions starting out at the beginning um, overall was, you know, how do we measure some of these factors for overall students? So when I go back to actually some of the slides I have here, that's where kind of this original question came in of what is the ideal way of kind of measuring um, at a post-secondary level or even K through 12 level, the access to opportunity or resources to students or the empowerment of do, do families and students feel that, you know, and know where to reach out in terms of navigating resources on campus? And what are the, the most impactful measures of this overall? And so speaking of that, I do have a couple of key points or ideas on how that can be measured. And a lot of it is tied to funding only because sometimes that is the, the easiest um, kind of qualitative measure to look at just in terms of at a larger um, overall um, macro level. But I, that's why I'm an advocate for mixed method studies where you take the narrative experience into context of giving opportunities for surveys and feedback from um, the different levels in your community, particularly maybe students or individuals that are impacted the most by the policies and practices. So for example, in K through 12, it could be you know, free reduced lunch and eligibility based on parents' income as a starting point for that to potentially identify populations in need. But then how are those populations experiencing you know, that sense of belonging? So then bringing a survey to them so they can highlight their own key points and needs. Um, so by percentage in local regions, so do our schools and the leaders of our schools also reflect the local community overall, not just in terms of uh, ethnicity, but also you know, uh, ability. We have many language learners um, also learning that you know, it's self-reported as well. So how do individuals identify GPA and academic achievement may not be a, entirely always a holistic indicator, but um, which is why sometimes the standardized testing comes into to play or to question, but thinking about different other, other opportunities such as concurrent enrollment or advanced placement. Some students who may not always have the funds to prepare for um, you know, SAT or advanced placement courses, what the experience looks like for them. And so how can we then um, kind of provide, you know, an equalizer to that or, you know, resources to help them gain access to those opportunities. Uh, different partnerships, so pipeline partnerships. So, for example, if a student does need to work on campus or if they don't have access to, you know, if they have food or housing and security concerns, how can we build, you know, a food pantry, reach out to our local communities um, and, and look at those um, maybe anonymous surveys. So sometimes there's a concern with students wanting to, you know, reveal their identities and reach out, especially when it comes to certain resources on campus. 
also in general, we have um, post-secondary measures, maybe specific. So how many students are full or part-time, uh, retention or graduation rates, of course, how many are receiving Pell Grants or Cal Grants or state-based grants. And then again, we have that kind of holistic sense of belonging. And so that's where um, in my dissertation, I largely focus on social, emotional, and academic learning-based statements and how they connect to um, student experiences directly. So there are some narrative statements that students posted based on a survey or a question that I evaluate overall. And then uh, we talk about, yes, return on impact. So overall, just thinking about, yes, so it's definitely important to holistically, not just from the funding aspects, but other aspects as well, think about impacts upon learning communities and overall. But yeah, any, any other key points or insights based on our conversation so far? I'm not sure if I understood it correctly, but the idea of sending out surveys for your constituents to measure their empowerment strikes me as exactly right. Why are we bringing, you know, why are the measurements coming from outside of the actual constituents? The idea that they should measure themselves and decide for themselves what's, what is accomplishment and what is progress. Yeah, exactly. So when we exactly provide that- right. Yeah, when we provide that framework or even that avenue of that feedback and, and then take that and incorporate and say, how can we use the feedback from the community to then shape and ensure our current policies and practices are, are equitable? Um, yeah, I think that's definitely a key piece as well. So let's see, moving on to our next, let's see. I a quick comment. Oh, yes, yes. Um, so we, our kids all just had the STAR test in Texas, which is still in use here and is tied to funding and a bunch of crazy stuff. Um, but there was a really interesting uh, interview on NPR with a couple of superintendents of schools. One of them is a neighboring city to ours. And he pointed out that the, the STAR measures the same thing in a, in a district with a 70% poverty rate and a 20% poverty rate. Mm -hmm. So schools are being rated based on how well kids are performing on these tests. And then that affects things like, you know, how they progress through the school system, whether or not they can place in AP classes, which then affects whether or not they can get into colleges. Yeah. Um, and, and so it's such a fundamentally, and so the thing that kind of always gets back, I get back to is the fact that public schooling is funded through property taxes largely. Mm -hmm. And so the wealth of a given area is, directly tied to how well that public school is funded, which is directly tied to whether or not those kids have the opportunity to go to colleges. Um, and so it's like just the absolute foundation of education in the US is so unequal. Um, I wonder if, you know, how much of this conversation is going on at that level mm -hmm. so that when they get to college, they're more prepared, they're more ready, they're less likely to drop out, you know, whether or not they're first generation, whether or not, um, you know, they have other barriers. Yes, I definitely agree. That's a great part of the conversation, especially with some policies in the past, like um, No Child Left Behind and some others that tied the performance of testing to the funding of schools, in which occasionally, if the school was a lower performing, you know, testing wise, they would receive less funding, which might indicate maybe they, they need more funding to help their students prepare or their teachers professional development or in general. Um, and then the other aspect is, so in terms of admissions, um, I, I've worked before as an admissions aspect of that. Um, how are we evaluating and co comparing the profiles of schools? So if a student comes from a school that is, um, is overall has 12 AP class offerings, how do we compare it to a school where a student only had five AP class offerings and those AP offerings were, looked different and the student could afford to take the AP test or the SAT five times, whereas in another district, the student could only take it you know, two times or even once. So thinking about, yeah, all those kind of macro and micro level impacts and resources are definitely uh, overall a, um, a, yes, impactful factor that creates a pipeline of access and affordability and concern for many students. So thank you, yeah. Any other points on that overall too, or follow-up insights? Yeah, and so just taking a look at, there was a, a previous um, presentation I did overall too, where we did have, oh, excuse me. So we did have a overall look at some additional resources that can help uh, supplement or maybe mitigate some of those access challenges. So we have um, some early start programs that are helping to funnel or connect 
some students to minimize their remediation of English and math courses as they enter into undergraduate study. So many state-based universities are connecting with K-12 institutions to identify through testing some of the students early on who might be at, at risk for um, you know, their math and based literacy-based skills. And uh, because the longer that they have retention-based courses or remedial-based courses, a lot of those credits won't count towards you know, their graduation overall. So therefore they may be you know, longer term to degree or time to degree. So thinking about that in addition to our um, concurrent enrollment opportunities. So there are many community colleges that work with high schools to offer free college credit, which can then be transferred for students um, so they can earn college credit before they graduate high school. Um, personally, I attended one of the uh, college credit um, or dual enrollment programs and I was able to graduate um, a year earlier because of the credit that I had earned for free through the uh, connected concurrent enrollment program through my high school. And there have been studies that have shown that, especially particularly in this Rhode Island study, that um, overall the concurrent enrollment programs help specifically many underrepresented or underserved students who might not have call access to college credit or resources otherwise. There are many high school districts that even offer um, uh, different vouchers of subsidies for textbooks for students, which has also been a concern at uh, many undergraduate institutions where they're now offering um, opportunities for students to have wider access to either online textbooks. Uh, they recently had a survey at a state-based institution where they, they were able to save over a million dollars in, um, in, in students' uh, costs just by making the textbooks more accessible overall. So there are a lot of great um, overall resources that connect students and connect their academic learning. There are also a couple of frameworks here too that can help you, uh, let's see, as a rapid framework, identify some of those key concerns as well. So this was the study from since they stay on the concurrent enrollment data for many of uh, for minimizing remedial programs. Um, and I'm going to just show you a, a framework that was a part of our previous study on evaluating how you can quickly or more quickly identify a framework in communities. So overall, let's see, we've got here. Yes, uh, I see a hand raised. Uh, sorry, uh, Lisa, I was just, wondering if you felt any resentment um, at you doing concurrent enrollment, studying extra hard, extra time, while perhaps, and I'm just inventing this, some of your compatriots were out, you know, playing tennis or something, or I don't know, on a school team or doing something. I don't know. Is that, was that an experience for you or, or did you not well, personally, um, actually, the unique aspect of the program was that um, it was a cohort of high school students who went together to community college to take uh, classes or coursework. So I think still having that experience of engaging with students of you know similar age range, in addition to students outside of our age range, which I think was a really valuable intergenerational experience too. Um, I didn't at all. I actually I felt it was almost a privilege to be able to. You know, we had community college students were some of the hardest working where we had, you know, international students who were transferring to our state schools or, you know, individuals or classmates who were my parents age or just having the opportunity to learn in and outside the classroom from that in addition to extracurriculars. So I was also one of those students who were involved in sports and everything too. But I think that um, it, it almost I really saw kind of a more full scope of what the education opportunities that could be offered outside of my high school because yeah, definitely one of those schools where we, we didn't have AP computer science or, you know, the other, other opportunities that some other um, high schools and districts had. So um, just, I think, recognizing that and hoping that many more students will hopefully be able to um, gain from those opportunities or similar, similar programs. So It's heartening here that it didn't isolate you, but like you found community in it, which is kind of cool. Yeah, definitely. The, the structure of the cohort, so it was about a group of 30 high school students going together and actually having a class together in addition to our community college classes. I think really helped as well with that experience in the transition. Um, it made it a lot more easy to be independent when we did finally get to the undergraduate college stage, at least for my personal experience. But there was another program where you you didn't have, you had a choice between going with a group of high school students and also just going on your own and not having high school classes. So. Yeah, I hope that answers your question overall. So. Yeah, it could definitely be more of a, a conversation here too. So um, here I just had a couple of points on the macro level. So we talked about, you know, the, the state or policy levels. 
the meso level. So the families, the parents, the communities. Um, so there's a couple of uh, spheres of influence. Uh, we also have the chrono system. So the time frame. So at the time, you know, 2008 um, and the previous recession might have impacted a lot of um, previous graduates and graduate students. Um, now currently into you know millennials and different generations into what type of you know communities that they are are serving or impacting having uh, you know post graduate experiences. So there's there was actually one other key point. But before I do, I'm definitely open to any other insights or questions you have or would like to ask throughout. So definitely please feel free uh, before we get to our, our closing point. But yeah, any other thoughts that came up from our conversation so far? And I've just stopped sharing so in case you want to say to our colleagues here. Yeah, feel free to take a minute to think about some of the insights or you think uh, so Lisa, maybe in, in the detail and, and again sorry for joining late but what, what would you say is your thesis uh, what what are you are there some conclusions you've drawn from this from your work here yeah so the conclusion is that um so particularly my dissertation that's focusing on your know, first generation underserved and under resourced students is that um, multiple measures are a holistic measure of you know diversity or equity or the ways that um, so so the main one of the main questions of my dissertation is what are the factors that impact students the most in their academic journeys who are underserved or underrepresented in their transition from K through twelve to post secondary so what are those factors impacting the most in their transition and how do we mitigate the the negative um, you know aspects of that and um, be able to kind of maximize the retention rates and the positive experiences and spheres of influences that students have. When they enter into their undergraduate institution, so that they're more likely to engage in the communities and not just um, towards completion, but overall, um, a holistically or positive experience. So, um, the thesis from that is in general, um, I approach it with a mixed method study. So, starting with um, some US Census data, looking at the demographics of what populations are most in need, what factors impact at the, the macro kind of demographic level. And then bringing it down to the individual level, I looked at the narrative experiences of the over 280 students and wow. basically from their direct um, you know, ex uh, experiences or how they've expressed how factors impact them, how can, what can we gather or learn from their direct experiences and how can we utilize what we've learned from students directly describing experiences and incorporate it into the programs and policies and approaches that we have. So I would say, gathering the voices and centering the voices of communities that are impacted the most and then how do we then incorporate that into the frameworks of support and systems that we have to ensure that it's equitable overall yeah. that is very impressive 280 participants wow. yeah yeah thank you yeah it was mostly from um so it was an anonymized kind of social media based post so the students had a chance to anonymously submit comments which allowed them to be i think more you know candid and they um, were given a number or assigned a number to each comment. Originally, I was planning to interview students more directly, but because of the circumstances with on campus and access over all the programs, um, we kind of shifted the focus a bit, which I think did work out well because I almost had a larger scope than I would have, you know, interview maybe like 20 or so students. So uh, I think it, it worked out well in that regard. And what I did then is I took um, I some of the data and the phrases from we have kind of a hundred or so narratives and I put it in a word cloud generator. Um, and then the word cloud gave, you know, the largest words are the ones with the most frequency. So um, the ones with the largest words are the most frequency, then I identified as common themes are the most impactful themes um, that students experience. So that was one metric or measure or way that I developed from a dissertation that uh, is connected to some other diverse other ways that you can gather, you know, from surveys and kind of creative ways that you can highlight themes from those surveys for identifying the needs of your communities. You sorted through 12,000 words? Yeah, it's so over time, oh. uh, the estimation was, <laughs> when I put it in the generator, the software, it said, you know, it had this many words. It was over an average of three years, about like 4,000 words per year. But this is this counted every single word the student put in there. <laughs> so that's what, that's what came out of the software. When I... Impressive. Well, any 
So oh, sorry, that step like graph that that is the word those those identify the measures now that you would say have, would have the most impact. Is that your point? Yes, correct. Did I read that correctly. So can you just repeat for at least for my benefit what those five or six or eight steps are that you identify? Sorry, just one minute. I may just have to adjust my audio for just a second. I hope you guys will forgive me if I'm blabbing too much. Just curious. Not at all. But, um, but yeah, so thanks for your patience. I was just uh, disconnecting the Bluetooth there. But overall, um, yeah, so the steps that I went through in particular for this metric or measure just took the um, the words that were generated over the three years from 2015 to 2018 into the word cloud generator. And I did have to identify or take out a few of the, you know, personalized um, kind of comments or identifiers there. But overall, um, it gave the opportunity to amplify the voices of students directly in that, you know, these are anonymized, um, you know, different narratives or, you know, phrases about their experiences. Um, so having that context, and it was directly connected to the university's, um, you know, web page or official, you know, social media page. So, so with that in mind, um, it actually inspired other similar pages called Class Confessions at other universities that um, then took place during that time frame. So uh, it was very interesting to see that phenomenon that take place overall. And it's still posted there. It's publicly available data. So I do have that overall. Um, so the slide that showed the stairs. Is that oh, oh, yeah, that was this is from my overall. Um, this is kind of the summary from that study overall that I presented at a, uh, this is the National Institute for Staff and Organizational Development. So this talked about dual enrollment specifically and why it's beneficial to um, particular populations. I see. So each of those bars, do, do, does that represent a strategy? Yeah, so different steps. Um, this is more so a graphic, but yes, yeah, so different steps within this overall too. Uh, of that particular study and then just in general. Yeah. Provide the link to this one too, if, if you'd like. So. Yeah, thank you. I'm just curious what those actual steps are that you identify. Yeah, so overall, yeah. So this was just uh, the general presentation that, um, if I don't have time to go through all today, so it, it kind of just started out with, you know, describing what success will look like at your institution. We talked about the, the early start programs and the dual enrollment. So this is just an example of that, a type of metric that could be used. Sometimes this isn't as easy, but defining your spheres of support. So support systems that might be already in place that could be utilized. So employee resource groups or staff or faculty resource groups, even student resource groups. So we have our clusters at fielding, we have many others that are based on, you know, research interests. So ethnography groups or, you know, environmental, you know, groups that are, in, you know, in, involved in the environment, or we had a lot of um, ability-based, um, you know, advocacy, you know, sessions this past week too. So the framework or action plan, there's steps that I presented in this particular framework as another metric also talked about the technological factors or barriers, the need of resources. So that's how do you just drop? Students on a different level. So thank you for your patience. Yep, so this is the, the action framework to highlight on the positive and negative trends, the needs and resources, the technological factors and different questions at the macro, micro and, and kind of meso level with the student or individuals at the center and the action plan stages of how to map against some of those quantitative and qualitative resources or experiences that are highlighted 
And this is kind of like a rapid sort of need finding process here that's highlighted in these quadrants. So. Yeah, any questions overall that I can? Well, I'd love to see this. Is there a way to share the slides or something? Yes, definitely. I have the links to this uh, Prezi that I will be able to provide to you along with the recording. And let me just have one last closing question here on the key goals or next steps for any action that, that came to mind when you were overall attending the presentation or that came up as far as, as it kind of evaluating some of the needs of your communities, building, gaining, maintaining trust across levels and stakeholders, listening sessions, resource groups, just different ideas as far as resources. I'll, I'll say something. I don't, um, I think my, my biggest question and not that I even have an answer for it is like taking this type of information specifically, you know, my biggest thing is around outcomes and uh and value and return on investment especially that's such a huge question nowadays like whether higher education is worth it so how do we gather this information yes but how do we relay that to prospective students in a way that like will resonate them with them and help them understand like what the potential value is for them so that's what kind of where i am is um is presenting value Definitely. Yeah. And I, I understand that perspective, especially with coming from admissions and student services. Um, I think the Georgetown report did a great job of highlighting some of those key aspects, whether the different paths students follow, whether it's graduate study or full or part-time work or going into, you know, coaching or consulting. And I think especially making connections with the alumni community kind of going on with the theme today. Personally, I think it's a scandal that we even have to ask the question, what's the ROI? I, I, I come from Holland and, and education is practically paid for by the state, but I, I love the fact that the conversation is, that that idea is beginning to infiltrate the conversation here. Yeah, that, definitely. You know, the United States as a culture, as a country, it directly benefits from the success of as many of its inhabitants as possible. Of course, yeah. Vested interest, and the fact that they don't accept that, um, you know, that, that the country with all of its resources actually ought to pay for college, I think it's a freaking scandal. Yeah, there are a lot of resources that show that civic engagement is increased, and also the um, crime rates of populations decrease when education increases. And of course, the direct pipeline of our economy and future workforce is connected to education as well as um, there are studies that have shown people that were least impacted by the recession were the ones that ha were able to have the credentials to be, you know, be able to pivot and to have that accessibility to different, um, you know, stages or opportunities. So thank you so much for, for offering all of your insights and, and your time and your questions. Yeah. Great. I think it's to come apart. I think it was to come apart, Maryland. They actually had the voting age at 16 that you could vote for like school board. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you have a lot of great insights too from your yeah, experiences too. Far. So, but yeah, appreciating all that was shared here. I may have to run in just a bit to uh, commute, but I really appreciated everyone's time and attendance. I just want to give space for any other questions before closing out the session today. Just a big thank you. Thank, thank you. you.